some new folks in here tonight, so you must be in the wrong class for some reason. I'm kidding. We're glad you're here. Um, do we have anybody we need to remember in prayer before we get started? Anybody specific we need to mention? Okay. If not, we'll, uh, we'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the blessings that you've given each one of us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here this evening. We're so thankful for your word and the information that we gather from it and the wisdom that we can gather from it. We pray, Holy Father, you will help us tonight as we study a portion of your word. Help us to use it and make ourselves better and make those around us better. I pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, first of all, Jeremy, he's not in here, but I want to thank him for doing a great job last week in class. I watched, watched that. It's, I don't know if you guys have ever gone back and watched class or watched it online, but I wish we could somehow have a microphone to hear the comments because it's like he's, he's in class and then he's standing here just looking. And I, I mean, I know somebody's making a comment, you know, because I've been here, but you just, can't, you just can't hear them. So anyway, great job last week, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, so we, I mean, we could do that. I mean, we could get that microphone and pass it around, this one. But anyway, I thought you did a great job. I appreciate that. So this week, we're going to talk about speech and what the Proverbs writers say about speech, because there's, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot in the Bible not just in Proverbs, but there is a lot in the Bible about speech. Um, and one thing that I found interesting about the way a lot of speech is described and the tongue and what we say and how we say it is that it can be both a blessing and a curse. So you can use your tongue to both bless people and curse people. So I was trying to think of some other things that are both a blessing and a curse. Can anybody think of anything right off the top of their head? Money. That's one thing I thought of, money. You know, m money could be a blessing or a curse, right? If you don't have any money, I guess you think, well, it would really be a blessing. But, I mean, you look at all the people that have won lotteries, I mean, I think probably 90% of them are all miserable but they win millions and millions of dollars and they get all this money and they're just miserable. So money, in some ways, could be a curse. Um, what else? Think of anything else? So I thought of that and I thought of one other thing, too. Do what? Beauty. Yeah, that's good. I, didn't, I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> no, that's good. Beauty. Yeah, beauty could be a, a, a blessing or a curse, absolutely. Because I know attractive people all the time are just getting shunned everywhere. They may go to the back of the line and they don't get any attention, right? <laughs> I don't know. I know as a drug rep, I, I, would always, I would always hate following a female drug rep and most female drug reps are, you know, are attractive. And I would always tell the doctor, I said, well, you know, the best way to get her to come back in here. And he go, what, tell me. I said, well, don't write her product. I said, don't, write, don't write her product and she'll keep coming back. But yeah, so, so that could be a blessing or a curse. What else? I thought of one other thing too. Lack of trials, okay. So, or lack of suffering, maybe. Lack of trials, yeah, because there is when you think about suffering, there is blessings in that, even though sometimes it's difficult to see, um, but can also be a curse because it's difficult and painful. Good. Which kind of ties into the one that I was thinking of, um, long life. A long life. That could be a blessing, right? Live a long time. But I was thinking of my grandmother who lived a long life, but she buried two husbands and outlived her three children, which that's a lot of pain and suffering to go through. So I thought that, that's something that I thought could be a blessing and a curse as well. So, but what are we talking about when we talk about speech or when we 
when we talk about the tongue? How could that be a blessing and a curse? That's true. That's true. It can get you into trouble and it can get you out of trouble. In my experience, it usually gets me into trouble. James chapter 3, verse 9. Back up to verse 8. But no human, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So that's how our speech is supposed to be, right? That's how our attitudes, our words towards others, that's how it's supposed to be. Is that always easy? It's not. And I, I mean, I think for me, one of the most difficult things regarding speech is speaking too quickly. I just, I think back to the example that I had growing up and that's the example that I got. You would, you said the first thing that came out of your mouth. Most of the time it's not building up, right? Most of the time it's not giving grace to those who hear it. It's just the opposite. Can you turn me down just a little bit, Scott? But what really bothers me, I think, is when others notice that. Like my wife, Laura, when she says, you sound just like so-and-so. You want to talk about changing directions. One, it makes me mad. Not mad at her for saying that, but mad at me for, for being that way. And then I think, I did, I sound just like him. I sound just like him. So, to me, that's a great example of maybe how not to be. And maybe it's taken me a long time to kind of get away from those habits, but I think a lot of how we react to things, things that we say, um, is from the own examples that we've been given, right? Because sometimes it's hard to overcome bad influences and bad examples. Sometimes it's difficult to do that. So when we look at Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A gentle tongue is the tree of life. What does that mean to you when you hear that? A gentle tongue is the tree of life. Yeah, it, it builds up whoever the words are coming out to, right? It, it is beneficial to them, or it should be, right? So, so let's look at some of the different impacts or different uses of speech. So the destructive uses, how, how, can, how can our speech be destructive? Look in Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. So one destructive use is lying, right? The lying is not only bad, but it's an abomination to God. What does that mean when we say it's an abomination? Somebody that really has a good vocabulary. Where's Will when we need him? He's got a big vocabulary. Because I think of abominable snowman. But what does that mean when we say an abomination to God? What's another way to say that? Contrary, offensive. So when we lie, right, that's a destructive use 
of our speech. And where does that come from? Where does lying come from? Look in chapter 10, verse 18. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters a slander is a fool. So you're really concealing hatred when you lie, right? Now, are there different degrees of lying? I mean, I know that we have this discussion a lot. I mean, we would like for there to be, right? That's, what are they called? They're called white lies, and they're not named after me. I heard it a long time ago, but a white lie, right? That's just one that doesn't really hurt anybody. Somebody, you know, may ask, does this dress make me look big or does it make me look fat? And then what does the good husband say? It doesn't. You, You don't look fat at all. You look beautiful, right? Now, that's not a lie, or is it a lie? I don't know. But is there different degrees or variations of lies? How do we, I mean, do we try and justify telling some lies and not telling others? And when would we do that? Justify it based on on our motive, okay? So when would be a good motive? If you have good motives or good intentions, okay, you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You don't want to hurt their feelings. Um, Is this casserole... Good. You like this? You like this dinner that I cook, right? I'm always. I mean, y'all got to come up with some other examples. Y'all got to help me out because I'm gonna get in so much trouble. I'm just. This is what I've heard from other people say. Did Did you like supper? Was it good? I mean, who's gonna say no, right? I mean, what intelligent man is gonna say no or woman if the man cooked? I mean, who's gonna say no? Okay. So Jews during the Holocaust trying to protect others from the Nazis that were trying to get them. Okay? I saw, um, y'all watch Andy Griffith? I love that show. It's got so many good lessons in it. Um, Andy was trying to teach Opie about telling the truth and obeying the law and doing things. And I think, what, I think he had a little kid or something. One of his little friends ran away from home and you know, Andy being the sheriff that he, he was, he had to betray Opie's confidence and call his parents and say, hey, your kid's run away, he's over here. And then that just made Opie so mad, right? It made him so mad because his father betrayed his confidence. And then the lesson that he taught him was he said, well, he says, if you've got a, you know, a, a pond or something and it's got a no swimming sign, but you see somebody that's drowning, do you not go save them because... Hey, I can't, I'm not supposed to go swimming. And he said, no, I'd go save him. And he said, well, that's kind of the same thing. So intentions, right, are, I won't say a valid reason for lying, but that is one reason that, that the truth may not be forthcoming, right? Any other examples of that? Do what? The things we tell children, oh. I hadn't even thought of that. Because I could think of one big one, right? I, mean, I didn't say that. But I mean, is, is that a lie? Is that something that's destructive and bad? Some people would argue that, you know, that is destructive. That's teaching children that you're not telling the truth. But in my mind, I know who Santa Claus is. So, Wayne, I wasn't going to say that. I wasn't going to out you like that. But we all knew. We all knew. So yeah, and then but sometimes it can be more serious too, like when you're, you know, maybe maybe you feel like that they're not old enough or mature enough to handle adult problems, right? Not necessarily that you would lie to them, but you may not tell them the whole truth because you know that they're not capable of understanding that. Which that would, that kind of makes me think of a whole other issue that we're dealing with these days in schools where they're trying to do that with a lot of children. They're putting mature ideas to kindergartners and first graders and second graders, which they're not emotionally stable enough or mature enough to even understand. That one's getting way sidetracked, right? So 
But lying really is, is um, fostered by hatred, especially when it's, in it, when it's not done with good intentions, which sometimes we, we agree that sometimes it is with good intentions that the truth is not forthcoming. But I think what the Proverbs writer is talking about here is people that are intentionally lying, that that is really backed by hatred. Yes? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. The consequences. Sometimes the consequences of the truth are not really what you want. And a lot of times, I think what you're saying is because of your own behavior, your own actions that you're trying to cover up or lie about. In Proverbs 26, verses 24 through 28, whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. So that's kind of what Clay was talking about, that deception, right? Where you're trying not to get caught for something that you've done. So do, the, do those usually, what, is, what does that lead to? What does one lie usually lead to? Another one. And then what does that lead to? Another one. And another one. And another one to kind of cover up all the lies that you've told. Right? So that's, a, that's another something she told me not to do, is say right so much. So you give somebody like a bell, and every time I say right, you just beep. I probably said it seven times. I have to go back and watch it. I, have to, I probably said it a bunch. So do I, have you noticed that I say that all the time? Maybe it's just her. Dot caller. Ellie has got one of those for her dog, and it, it will light you up. That would be good. That would be good training. Um, oh, you'll do the remote. Thank you so much for that. But yeah, one lie leads to another, right? One lie leads to another, to another, to another. And it's like I've seen so many movies where some of the characters in the movie are, you know, they're in trouble, they've done something wrong, they lie to cover it up. But then the whole rest of the movie is they keep on lying and keep on lying to keep on covering up the stuff when it's like if they just would have admitted what they did was wrong at the very beginning, none of this other stuff would have happened to you. But all this other bad stuff happened to you because you continually lied and lied. So, so that's, a, that's a behavior we need to avoid. Another destructive use of our speech is flattery, right? Flattery. I mean, do we all like to be flattered? I mean, kind of, right? Who doesn't? You like my shirt? Philip, your shirts are always nice and ironed and pressed. Quality cleaners, there you go, free advertisement. But now, if, if Philip was hiring somebody and I was needing a job and I was saying that to Philip, Philip, you've been working out. Which is hey, this is a <laughs> hey, this is a this is a true story. This is a true story, and I'm I'm not going to mention any names, but it's like this this one person who sells items, um, and I, I rarely see him a lot, but every once in a while you'll need one of these items, and and every time I go to his place, I mean every single time he says the same thing. He goes, Chris, he goes, man, you've been you've been working out, haven't you? And I I know exactly what he's doing. I told him, I said, man, I said you say that to me every time. No, man, you do. You look big, man. You, you look like you've been working out. But flattery, right? Flattery is a destructive use. How, how can it be destructive? Flattery. 
flattery be, be bad or a negative? Because we've just talked about the good, the good times about flattery, but how can it be, how can it be negative? Okay, yeah, it's, it's not very genuine, is it? It doesn't seem very genuine. Proverbs 29, 5. 29, 5. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. What does that mean? A man who flatters spreads a net for his feet. It's manipulative, okay? Because like I said, like if Philip was hiring and I kept on bragging about his shirts and things like that, complimenting him all the time, what am I really wanting from him? A job, right? Yeah, but it's, um, I'm in a way trying to manipulate him to think more highly of me so he'll hire me. And I, I kind of picture, I don't know, you tell me, when, when I think of a net at my feet, are you kind of, do you picture like walking along and then you're in a trap and then somebody pulls a rope and you're pulled up by and have y'all seen one of those? That happened on Gilligan's Island all the time. Has anybody ever watched Gilligan's Island? They would always get stuck in those nets. Or you're walking along and it kind of trips you up. I think a net at your feet, like if you're going fishing or something, you've got one of those nets you're throwing out and you're trying to walk along, I can see you kind of tripping up, right? Anything else on that one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and what was the word you used, Melissa? Manipulative. Yeah, that's a good word. That's good. Yeah, you're trying to manipulate. Right, exactly. You're, you're wanting something in return. Um, the Proverbs writer also describes it as being used by the adulteress. Look in chapter 6, verse 24. 6.24. To preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. I mean, that, makes, that paints a pretty good picture too, doesn't it? I mean, I keep telling these stories about myself. When am I going to learn? So, I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. I was in New Orleans for like a meeting or something one time. And you know the famous street in New Orleans. Any of anybody else been there? So don't. Okay, so y'all been there. It's a tourist attraction, right? All I'm doing is walking down the street. But what kind of establishments are on Bourbon Street? Which again, I'm green to a lot of stuff. I just thought it was a bunch of bars and bands and stuff. It's not quite that. There's a little more to it. Speaking of adulteresses, you've got them trying to entice you to come into their establishment, right? That's kind of what I picture here, what the Proverbs writer is talking about, a a woman of ill repute, I guess, trying to get more customers, right? So she would use flattery and a smooth tongue, right? I keep doing it. Shot collar. Let's see, also 721. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. What do we think of when we think of smooth talk? A smooth talker. What do you think about when you hear that? A salesman. Yeah, a salesman. They're smooth talkers, which that's what I am. I mean, that's what I do. I sell stuff. And I, could, I mean, I could talk all day long to people I don't even know. I, could, I mean, I could do it all day long. Laura hates it. She hates small talk. But I could do it all day long. I mean, I could stand there in front of somebody and talk about rocket ships or baseball or football or whatever. I mean, I could just stand there and and talk. Um, But then when you start talking about your product or whatever it is you're trying to sell, then that's when you kind of have to be creative in the transition, you know, because I'm really not here to talk to you. I'm here to sell you something, you know, because I need to get paid, so I'll sell you something. So that's kind of what I think of when I hear smooth talker, like a smooth, he's a, he's a smooth talker, which we've all seen salesmen like that. If you've ever been to buy a car, those guys are smooth, aren't they? I mean, I've bought several cars that I've had for a little while, and I thought, I wish I wouldn't have bought that car. I wish I wouldn't have bought that extra warranty, 
right? Have y'all ever done that? My advice is not to, to do that, but sometimes the warranties are good, right? When something breaks. So what about gossip? Gossip is another destructive use of our speech. Chapter 11, verse 13. Other names for gossip are talebearer, slanderer, whisperer. So 11, 13. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. So what, what, is, a, what is a gossip? How would you define a gossip? Talking about somebody behind their back? I mean, what would, what would, what would we, we categorize as gossip? Stirring up trouble where it doesn't need to be stirred up. Um, and this verse that we read kind of indicates someone has told you something in confidence, Right? And then you go over here to this group of friends, and then you kind of talk about what they were telling you in confidence. That's, that's a form of gossip, isn't it? I mean, you may not be talking about somebody, but you're, you're betraying their confidence, right? Why is that? How is that destructive? Okay, it, it destroys that trust that you have. Right? It destroys that trust that you have between you and that person that confided in you. What else does it destroy? It's, it's very, I think it's very destructive. It's destructive in a lot of ways. It's destructive for the person that told you that. Um, because... Right, right. So you, you've destroyed their character... In the other person's eyes, right? The other, I know. Sorry. But that's, that is true. That is correct. That it, um, it's destructive for a lot of people. Um, your, what was the word you used? Starts with an I. Influence. Yeah, influence. They're, yeah, the influence that they may have. Because now they look at them a little differently, right? Intent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because we know the effect that gossip can have. So if you do it intentionally, you're intentionally trying to damage or harm somebody's um, right, correct. I, I do too. I think it's more more of an intentional. Yeah, well, and I think also, too, in that situation, like if I've always thought that if, if you have an issue, if there's an issue that arises between you and another member or that you feel like another member is involved in some behavior that's not appropriate, I've always felt like that it's my responsibility to talk to that person. Now, sometimes that may be a difficult conversation, um, yeah, I think that, that should be our first choice. If that's not possible, then I think what Will is saying is correct, that, hey, you know, we've got a member of our church who is, you know, on Bourbon Street all the time. Right? Oh. I never knew how, how much I said that until I said it, so now everybody's going to know. Maybe it'll help me to correct that problem. It's like when you say a speech, if you say um all the time, you don't really realize how often you say um until somebody says you say um all the time. So gossip is bad. It's destructive in a lot of ways, right? It can create strife between you and the person that you talk to. It destroys character and integrity. 
Um, and it can destroy friendships as well. 17, 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but who repeats a matter separates close friends. So I think what he's saying here is that if between you and a friend an offense occurs, just between you and that friend, as long as you are fine with that friend, there's no need for you to go tell somebody else the offense that just happened, even though they may have apologized for it and said, I'm so sorry. For example, like if I speak before I think sometimes, and then I say, oh, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have said that. You know, there's no need for that person to go say, can you believe what he just said to me? Can you believe that? So then that person would think I was horrible when I just apologized for it. But they didn't tell that I apologized. Destructive. What other destructive behaviors? Can you think of anything else? With speech, how it can be destructive? Being negative, okay, just being negative. I, I love being positive. I'm like a, the cup is half full. I like to be so positive. Look at the, look at the bright side, right? I know, I know, I'm way too conscious of it. So look at the bright side. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it again. But negativity um, can be destructive. Negativity can be destructive. What else? How else can speech be destructive? Sometimes it's just mean, isn't it? Verbal abuse. I, sometimes it can be very abusive. Tear people down. Just out of, out of anger a lot of times, out of frustration. Um, maybe covering up for mistakes we've made. We lash out at other people. Um, but our speech sometimes can be very destructive and very harmful to people. I think of um, the Internet. I mean, think of that. Think of, think of some posts you may have seen. I mean, people are so brave and so courageous to post these things that they would never say to that person but they'll be glad to post it on whatever thing that they posted to make a comment on that. And once you do that, that's there for a long time, and a lot of people can see that. And then how often, too, is maybe what you write taken a different way than how you meant it? One thing I've learned is sarcasm does not really play well or translate well in texts. Because I'm, I mean, I have a very sarcastic sense of humor. So if I would like to text something in a sarcastic tone, it doesn't really come across that way to the person reading it. It's, it's offensive. And I think the same can be said about commenting on somebody's post. So those, those words can be destructive and hurtful. And again, harming your influence. You know, I think of individuals who, and I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, but I do think of individuals that I've seen stuff that they've posted or that they've shared or commented on this or commented on that, and I think, really? It kind of makes me think a little bit less of them. I think, well, I'll question your judgment. Like, if you're supporting this, I don't, I don't know if you're the person that I thought you were. So a lot of times that can be destructive, and that could be me reading it the wrong way. Okay, again, with something that you post online, you don't have that luxury of feedback unless you want to read the, all the negative comments about your comment. So what's the remedy to that? Pretty simple. I just don't. I just don't. I don't read them. I don't, I don't comment on anything. I just, I just don't, because for those reasons. I mean, a lot of you may do that. I'm not being critical if you do, but I'm just saying be careful because the reader does, may not get the same impact as the writer. I think a lot of times it's, it's difficult. What else? Yes. Yes.
Very good. Did everybody hear that? That was good. Mm -hmm. Right. That was the first time in a long time. But you're correct. See, I didn't want to say it on myself. I was, I was just commenting on him. That didn't count. But that's, that's absolutely accurate. Um, because I, I think that's, that's something that I had always struggled with, was knowing what to say. It's like looking for opportunities to say something positive or to build people up. And I think, I think there's a key to that. For me, there's been a key to that. Trying to, trying to be more positive and trying to be more encouraging in the things that you say. Um, I, I know when, when Connor and, and Ellie and Walker were little and they were playing, learning to play sports and learning to play ball, I, I would try to, I mean, I wouldn't try to tell them, hey, you're going pro, you're, you're, you're pro, NBA. I, mean, I, don't, I was never that, that was flattery, but if they did something well during a game, even if they may have lost the game or, you know, maybe had some turnovers or whatever, I would really try and focus on what they did well and not try to beat them up. Did I? I mean, I tried to do that. As far as you remember? Good. I mean, because, I mean, if, if you're negative, then they kind of have a negative feeling about themselves too, right? Yes. I've heard that before. I've heard that before. If you can't say anything good, don't say anything. But then that leads to the problem that Clay was talking about, is you could be too silent. Or you could have an opportunity to say something good, and you don't. And that's, where, that's one thing where I had always struggled, is one, saying the first thing that came to my mind. That was the, I think that was probably the biggest issue that I had to try to overcome, which I'm still working on. And then the second thing was trying to find something positive to say. Was trying to be positive instead of tearing down and being negative. Anything else? All that talk's so negative, right? So what about positive? What about some positive ways we can use our speech? What are some constructive uses? Chapter 10, verse 11. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. We've read that already, haven't we? Fountain of life. Something sounded similar to it. But I like it, though. It works, doesn't it? Chapter 20, verse 21. An inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. No, that's not it. Chapter 10, sorry. Chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. Chapter 10. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. So our words can be righteous, right? Righteous and building up. Chapter 16, verse 24. Gracious words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Has anybody had a honeycomb lately? I mean, you ever, I, I think I ate some as a kid. Did y'all ever eat honeycombs? What's your remembrance of them? It's, gum. it's waxy in it, but it's sweet though, and I loved it. It was so good. You just threw it away and get some more. But that's kind of that's that's what that's what this kind of compares words to. Are your words as sweet as a honeycomb? 
Mine are not always. Chapter 12, verse 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. So finding something good to say in those difficult moments instead of being silent. The other side of your story was that people talk too much. And sometimes you can't even get a word in because people continue to talk. But saying something good to somebody who's having a bad day, even if it's a stranger. I saw, I think it was a show, I don't know if it was a movie or something, but I saw this guy, he was an older guy, and he was, he was trying to explain to his friend or whoever he was with how to avoid getting in a fight with somebody. If somebody was angry or you wanted to fight you, he said, tell me you like their shirt. He said, what? He goes, no, it works every time. He goes, tell me you like their shirt. He goes, they won't want to fight you. So he was at the convenience store or something, standing in line, and the guy turns around, he's all mad at him. He goes, hey, I like that shirt. He goes, really? Yeah, I just got this shirt. So it worked. So if you don't want to fight anybody, tell them you like their shirt. So I think a lot, a lot too, going back to what Clay was saying, as far as knowing when to say something is... Is challenging sometimes. Knowing when when to say the right thing, when to when to not say anything is difficult. So timing a lot of times is important. Chapter fifteen, verse twenty three. To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. So being well-timed, being well thought out, 1528. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. What's that saying to you? Think before you speak. So... A lot, and a lot of that, too, is wisdom. Like I said, it's taken me a long time to kind of break some of those old habits that I had when I was younger. So a lot of that comes with maturity and wisdom um, and caring about people, right? Doing so well. Oh, is it time already? Is that the second bell? I thought that was the first one. I was going to really try to get through here. All right, two things that I want to leave with that really made an impact on me. Matthew 15, 11. Matthew 15, I think it's 15. Okay, this is Jesus. He said, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. He was talking about food and what you eat. But I think his greater point was the words that you speak can harm you a lot worse than what you eat. And then this next one, I think this is Matthew 12. Yeah, Matthew 12. Okay, here it is. Matthew 12, verse 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Let me read that again, because I had to read that several times, because that really made an impact on me. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. That means every careless word that you speak, you're going to have to account for on judgment day. Kind of makes you think a little bit before you speak, doesn't it? Anything else? Sorry I kept you longer. It's free, no charge.
See you next week.